Okay, the new topic, macroeconomics. This is almost entirely different from uh, microeconomics. Remember, in economics, we've got these two branches. Microeconomics under, tries to understand how individual people and firms behave. And macroeconomics is about the economy as a whole. Okay? So when you hear stuff about like, the economy is growing, or um, trade between countries, or unemployment rates, these are all related to macroeconomics. Now, macro has a lot of different theories of how macro works and the macro economy works. Um, it's a difficult subject to understand theoretically because it's very hard to do experiments or to look at what happens across a broad group of, like in micro we study, a broad group of workers over time, factors that impact their wages, earnings, whether they t make decisions to stay at home after they have children, whether they make decisions to continue on further in their education, what determines um, how much a husband works versus a wife. I mean, we, we have like thousands and thousands of families to study to answer those questions. With macroeconomics, we study countries. And so we just have hundreds of countries, and they're all so different to begin with. So um, there are many theories of how macroeconomies work. Mostly, though, what I'm doing for the next couple of weeks is going over some of the basics. Um, and so, yeah. I've got a picture here of macroeconomics. Does anyone want to guess what this is? You're never going to guess it. Okay. These are business cycles. Business cycles? Okay, it's a big deal in macroeconomics um, that, okay, the economy tends to grow over time, but it comes and goes in waves. Okay, business cycles. Okay, now this is the type of thing where I'm not going to get into the theory of what possibly causes business cycles and how we predict um, where the economy is going next. We're going to start with some very basic stuff instead. Okay, first, some important macroeconomic measurements. There are maybe three or four or five important measurements to get you all familiar with macroeconomics. Okay, um, and these are things that you have likely heard, but no one has really given you a lecture on what they mean, okay? Gross domestic product is a measure of how much a country produces, okay? Um, you know, like how much its economy produces. Um, unemployment is sort of a measure of the health of the labor market, okay? But to be defined precisely, it's the percentage of workers who um, uh, kind of would like jobs but cannot find them. Okay, and third on the list, inflation. It's a general increase in prices. Um, guess what? There's a New York Times article this morning saying that we can anticipate increases in prices of certain goods. On average, prices increased by seven-tenths of a percent since um, last month. Oh, hang on just a second. Continuing on. Inflation is a general increase in price levels. Things become more expensive over time. You've heard your grandpa talking about how back in the day, a gallon of gas cost 12 cents and yada, yada, yada. Well, I mean, that's, that's not the same as 12 cents today. Just generally, 12 cents back in the day went further than 12 cents today. It's called inflation. It's not that gas has become more expensive has really become more expensive. It's just that the price numbers have changed. Now, if there's another one to add to the list, 
It's the stock market. But it'll depend on how much time I have over the semester. Um, the stock market is a complicated thing. Okay, so let me get started. Gross domestic product. The gross domestic product is defined as the market value of all final goods and services produced in a country Okay, in a country during a time period. Okay, so I've broken up this definition onto several lines so that I can focus on all these different terms. Um, th this is the complete definition of gross domestic product, which... Okay, I'm just going to call GDP, gross domestic product. It's a measurement of how much a country produces. But here's the technical definition. And you all might have noticed that I can say this just straight off the top of my head, even though there are a bunch of significant phrases that go into this. Um, okay, so to measure the value of what a country's economy produces. Okay, so by the way, I'll start at the bottom, in a country during a year, okay? So, at least usually a country um, uh, during a time period, and usually a year. So you'll hear about um, U.S.'s GDP in, in 2020, for example. That's how much the United States as a whole produced in 2020. You might hear about GDP in China in 1990. And again, it's a measure of how much was produced in that country during a time period. Usually the time period is a year. Usually it's a country, though it's also valid to talk about the GDP of California or New York or like any political geographical area. I suppose. Okay, but these other phrases. GDP is the market value of what a country produces. In other words, the way that we summarize how much a country produces is based, it's not like, well, the United States produced 12,000 tons of wheat, it produced 500 cars, it produced um, 7,000 haircuts. We don't describe every individual item. Instead, the, this measure GDP summarizes what a country produces in terms of the market value. Okay? So again, instead of just a list of what the country produces, let's summarize that, those items by giving the market value of the items. Okay. Next, I'll stress the word all. At least theoretically, it's supposed to be everything produced in the country, okay? Though, final goods and services only. So, remember, in our model of, of how things get produced, there are the factors into production. Firms produce the goods and services that consumers want but there are factors that go into production. Any of the intermediate factors that go into production are not counted in GDP. So, you know, if a uh, farmer grows wheat and sells that wheat for $100 to a bakery that produces bread that it sells for $500, the only thing that gets counted in GDP is the final product, okay? The $500 worth of bread that goes to consumers. The wheat, which is an intermediate good, um, does not get counted. Okay, produced, 
I mean, so this is um, not counting the value of things that are already owned. You know, if, if the United States has a wealth of cars that already exist, that's not what GDP is calculating. It's calculating how much gets produced in that time period. Okay, so the final thing is that, okay, gross domestic product. Um, the the fine, sorry, just blanked. Um, okay, gross domestic product is sort of like the income of the country. It's what the country produces and sells. Okay, um, so historically, for hundreds of years, economists have been interested in the general question of what makes a country wealthier. In fact, really the first economics book, um, like modern economics book, was written by Adam Smith, is the father of modern economics. Um, his book was called On the Wealth of Nations. So, I mean, again, this is essentially the first economics textbook, almost. But he laid down many of the theories that we currently um, follow. And so the basic idea behind consumer surplus, producer surplus, the idea that in the absence of any externalities, um, uh, a free market, an unrestricted market, will maximize total surplus. And that everyone, the idea that everyone behaving in their own self-interest will be good for others, okay? So he, he has in his um, book, uh, in, in On the Wealth of Nations, he has an example of a butcher in a town wanting to make as much business as possible. There's going to be, uh, he's, the, the butcher will try to produce the best good at the lowest cost in order to make as much profit as the butcher can. And so, like, just the butcher being selfish is, in fact, good for consumers who are going to be getting the best product at the lowest cost. And other ideas, like, there is a financial incentive to innovate, right? Um, the butcher wants to get wealthier. The butcher can come up with ideas to run a more efficient shop, okay? And in the long run, inefficient businesses will will leave the market and efficient firms will survive. So Adam Smith laid down a lot of important concepts. He might not have used the same vocabulary, but um, he did like start out with this book, really like began um, the modern way of thinking about economics and the importance of or the benefits of a market economy. Coincidentally or not, um, this book was published in 1776, okay? I don't think it's a coincidence that that happens to coincide with, what was the other big thing that happened in 1776? Okay, I see a couple of hands. The American Revolution, a new country was founded, and by golly, if, a, if there isn't one country that just loves market economies and kind of unrestricted market economies, it's the United States. To be honest, the U.S. has also been the superstar of economic growth from nothing 250 years ago to 
having the world's largest economy today. Okay, so, okay, anyhow, but notice that when Smith writes this book, he doesn't call it like how to make, how to make your family richer using economics. It's on the wealth of nations, how nations can become wealthier. And again, part of, a, a, a substantial part of his argument is just free markets, sort of, trade between countries. Um, uh, the, the idea that trade between countries was good was like radical at his time. Um, uh, people had the mentality that whenever you sent something overseas, it was draining your country's economy and didn't think about the more complete picture that when you send stuff overseas, you are also purchasing stuff from other countries and, and um, it makes both of you wealthier. Um, uh, anyhow, so this question, what makes a country wealthier? One of the oldest questions in at least modern economics um, and Adam Smith kind of founded or like lay down these principles of what makes an economy work efficiently in order to think about what makes a country wealthier, what contributes to the wealth of the nation. Now, going back to GDP, we need a way to measure the income of the nation, and the most common measurement is GDP. Okay. Theoretically, it's the market value of all, again, final goods and services produced in a country during a time period. Okay? And it, it measures the income of the country, like this is what we bring in, but it also measures the expenditures of the country. Um, so, it's maybe important to keep in mind that income equals expenditures. The more a country produces, the more it can spend on things. Okay? And uh, it can spend on a handful of things. It can spend on consumption goods for people. It can spend the money on investing in economic growth. It can spend the money on government uh, programs. But the more that we have on the left-hand side here, like more income the country produces, the more expenditure it has. Okay? So, and, and I think it's hard to argue that more expenditure, like being able to purchase more stuff, whether it's consumption goods, investing in the future, or government programs, just the potential to purchase more stuff is good. Okay, and this statement is like income equals expenditure. This is like true. This is identity. Sometimes we say this is an identity because it has to be true. Um, you know, for example, maybe a simpler example is that for an individual person, um, for an individual person, lifetime income equals lifetime consumption plus or minus any bequests. Okay. What you earn over your life is equal to what you consume. Okay? And I say plus or minus any bequest. Maybe you leave money behind for future generations, maybe you inherit something from a previous generation. Aside from that, this, like, if not for bequests, 
like leaving money, um, again, leaving money to a future generation or inheriting money from a previous generation. What you earn over your lifetime is equal to what you consume. The things have to balance out. Okay. Um, uh, so the same type of thing is true for a country. What it produces will be equal to what it spends. Okay, and this leads to, I guess, four components of GDP. What does GDP go to cover? Okay. Everything that gets produced gets used for one of four purposes. Consumption, investment, government expenditures, and there is one that I should have had on the previous slide, um, exports, and I'll say net exports. Okay, so, um, you know, consumption, these are goods and services that are enjoyed um, Um, enjoyed by people. Okay. Purely for our happiness, more or less. Um, okay. Investment. These, uh, these are um, things that are produced in order to help the economy grow. Um, so, investment adds to future productivity. Okay, government expenditure, this is stuff purchased and used by the government, um, used in government programs. And then exports, are stuff that is sent outside the U.S. Okay, we're outside whatever country. So everything that a country produces gets used for one of these four purposes. Okay? Every widget and gadget and doohickey and service produced in the United States goes to one of these four things. Either it's a consumption good, something that makes people happy when they enjoy it, or it's investment, like it's building a new factory to, to um, uh, uh, build, building a new factory that's going to produce stuff in the future, or building a new bulldozer. Okay, things that are going to make things that are going to contribute to productivity in the future. Okay. Government expenditures, okay, this is the third use of stuff that the U.S. produces. Some of it goes to the government. Um, it's used by the government, you know, for example, to build roads, to fund the military, um, uh, to pay for Actually, let me back up on that last one. Um, okay, um, so it is stuff that is used for one of those purposes. And the final thing is, if something is not used for consumption, investment, or government, it gets sent overseas. Okay, um, now I write here net exports. Net exports are exports minus imports. Got it? Okay, so when I say net exports, it means that difference. Net exports are positive when a country ships more stuff overseas than it purchases from overseas. Net exports can be negative 
That means that a country imports more than it exports, which is traditionally true for the United States. The U.S. imports more stuff from overseas than it exports. Okay, so it has negative net exports. Okay, now, I'm going to bounce off onto a tangent and define two words. Um, first is, well, two phrases, a trade surplus. Another is a trade deficit. Uh, what did I just write? Deficit. Okay. A trade surplus between two countries um, means that one country exports more than it imports. Okay, actually, I should say we can describe a country's trade surplus with another specific country or with the rest of the world. Okay, a trade surplus occurs when a country exports more. A trade deficit is when a country imports more than it exports. So, in other words, this net exports is positive when a country has a trade surplus, net exports in dot X for net exports, and when a country has a trade deficit, net exports are negative. Okay, so... If you've ever wondered what those words mean, um, now you have definitions. I'm going to go off on another little tangent, which is that there is nothing inherently good or bad um, nothing inherently bad or good about a trade deficit or surplus. Okay, um, so the next time you hear some politician complaining about the trade surplus or trade deficit more often with another country, and, and the U.S. has a such and such billion dollar trade deficit with Mexico. It doesn't mean anything. It, re it really doesn't. Um, it, it has more to do with accounting and what goods and services get counted as produced in the U.S. versus are not produced. Um, and, and it's complicated. But um, <laughs> anyhow... Recognize trade deficits and trade surpluses are not inherently good or bad. Um, in fact, in one interpretation, probably the best interpretation is that trade must always be equal in the two directions. And the reason there appears to be a trade deficit or surplus has to do with... Um, uh, has to do with essentially accounting problems. That if the U.S. if if U.S. Um, uh, factories produce some widgets that get shipped overseas, let me flip this around. If a Chinese factory produces some widgets and ships them to the U.S. And meanwhile, the, um, a U.S. company ships a 
like ships a um, uh, like a technology expert to China to do work to provide services. Those those two exchanges might be equal and opposite, but one, but but um, they don't get treated the same in counting surplus. The, the um, American who goes to work overseas and bring that money back to the U.S. does not get counted as part of trade, even though the goods that get sent over to the U.S. and money sent back to China, that does get counted as part of Chinese GDP and part of Chinese um, trade. It's all essentially an accounting mistake or interpretation. But the money that goes from the U.S. economy to the Chinese economy, or the goods and services that go from the U.S. economy to the Chinese economy must exactly balance the goods and services that flow in the other direction. Um, okay. Anyhow, um, so I've talked about these components of GDP. And, okay, we cannot always compare GDP of two countries and just simply say which country is doing better economically. Okay, so there are a handful of things that we often do to adjust GDP measurements for differences between countries or changes over time. Okay, so one thing, let's see. Um, okay. If we're comparing the GDP of two countries, say um, comparing the GDP of the United States to the GDP of Mexico, what would be some things that make the comparison like not a straightforward comparison of the state of the economy of the two countries? Grayson? The difference in currencies. The difference in currencies. Um, Okay, so I will put that on the list. Um, but it's not... Okay, but, but I'll address that. Um, difference in currencies. Now, the standard way to handle that is um, just do the exchange rate. Okay, but it's a valid concern when the exchange rate isn't a perfect thing to use. Um, it, like, it, some countries have artificial exchange rates, and then, then um, it, it's not a correct adjustment for, for the two countries. But um, this is, and, and also it's related to something else. That, that I hope someone might mention. Okay, but what are some other things that make it hard to compare the, 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 the or just to say that the U.S. produces more stuff than Mexico, or to say that the U.S. produces more stuff than Switzerland might not be um, an accurate comparison of the wealth of Swiss people versus the wealth of Americans. Okay. One, okay, I'll mention one thing is that everything else the same, like it, um, I would expect the, the, economy of the, the U.S. to be three times the size of the economy of Mexico simply because U.S. has three times as many people as Mexico, right? Okay, so the number of people in a country impacts um, uh, the number of people in the country certainly impacts GDP and 
to say that the GDP of the United States is many, many times bigger than the GDP of Switzerland doesn't mean that the standard of living in the U.S. is many, many times that of Switzerland. So often we will adjust GDP for population. Um, let me say divided by population. Okay, so, um, uh, and then we tack on the phrase per capita. Okay. Per capita, that's Latin for literally per head, but um, uh, per person. Okay, so a very common adjustment that you'll see when discussing the GDP of two countries or looking at GDP of a country over time is that it will be expressed as GDP per capita, and that simply means divided by the size of the population. Okay, um, so next, um, okay, another concern comparing two countries. Um, does anyone want to make a guess or throw out an idea, I should say. Okay, cost of living. Okay, the cost of living is just simply different between the United States and Mexico in general most things are less expensive in Mexico, um, especially things that are labor intensive are, are less expensive in Mexico. <sighs> things in Switzerland tend to be more expensive. So, and this is even after adjusting for differences in the exchange rate. So um, when I lived in Mexico, and this has been 15 years, I rented an apartment from a colleague of mine at the university who was gone for a couple of years. He, he didn't want to sell his apartment. And he also didn't want to lose his cleaner because she was so wonderful. And um, the cleaner would come in once a week. So, so a one of the terms of our subleasing it was we had to keep the cleaner. Um, so, and she'd come in once a week about 10 or 11 in the morning and she would just work until everything was done. Like she would clean out everything in the dishwasher. She would, um, in, in the uh, refrigerator, throw out old food, wipe all the shelves, just have it beautiful. She would wash all the laundry. She would iron my socks. She would rearrange my closet in ways I didn't like, but she'd do this every week, and we would pay her 200 pesos a week, which... Um, at those exchange rates was about $20, okay? Well, it was $20 a day. It was fantastically inexpensive. Um, okay, so even at the ex current exchange rates, money goes further generally in some countries than in others, okay? $20 will buy a lot of domestic service in Mexico, much more than $20 would purchase in the U.S. So calculating differences in cost of living is difficult. But um, often these, this is called purchasing power parity. Purchasing power parity, um, abbreviated PPP. Parity means equal. Okay, um, that things are on par with one another. So, uh, trying to adjust things so uh, prices so that they have equal purchasing power. Um, and this is a matter of trying to price out. 
like a bundle of goods in one country and the same bundle of goods in another country. Does that kind of make sense? Like you, you think of like, what would a typical family purchase in a year? And you price it in Mexico. You price out that same set of goods in the US. You price out the same set of goods in, in um, uh, Switzerland. And it gives an idea of how much more expensive it is to live in one country than another. Okay, so that's called purchasing power parity. Um, so if you hear, um, if you hear some, if, if you hear um, a description of GDP in such and such country per capita PPP, the PPP means adjusted for cost of living. Okay, um, now, just an interesting idea. There's a news magazine called The Economist. Okay, which is a great news magazine, especially for topics that relate to economics. And every year, they track the price of Big Mac hamburgers. Okay, around the world. Okay, just it's sort of an interesting thing. It's interesting on its own, but it's also interesting because it tries to get at something important, which is purchasing power parity. Um, it's a simpler approach than pricing out a complex bundle of goods that families might want. You don't have to go around from region to region of the country figuring out what these different goods cost. Big Mac, it's very simple to see what the price is. McDonald's restaurants are all around the world, right? A Big Mac hamburger is a standardized product, and it uses kind of a representative amount of like labor, agricultural inputs, capital, machinery, um, like a fairly balanced mixture of those different things. And so maybe it's a represent, maybe it represents what the, the cost of living is in that country. So anyhow, um, it's interesting that this news magazine, really one of the best news sources in the world for econ-related stuff, halfway takes it seriously that people might want to know the cost of a Big Mac in Moscow versus the cost of a Big Mac in Pretoria, South Africa. Okay, um, now, a third adjustment is for inflation. Um, and things become more expensive over time. You know, again, when your grandpa talks about how much gas cost back in 1960-something, well, that's not a, like, the change in gas prices is not really a fair comparison because everything has become more expensive just across the board. Salaries have gone up across the board. And just, like, if all prices double over a 15-year period, and all wages double over a 15-year period, nothing has really changed. Everyone can still purchase the same amount of everything they could before, but the dollar amounts are different. And so if we measure the dollar amount of, of GDP, it would have doubled but purely because of inflation. Okay, so inflation is defined as a general increase in price levels. Um, okay, just 
like if everything increases by 3% from one year to the next. Okay. And economists use two terms to discuss money over time. Nominal means that the values are not adjusted for inflation. Whereas real means that the values have been adjusted for inflation. Okay, so now when your grandpa tells you about that cheap gasoline back in the 60s, um, that's, that, that, those values are almost certainly nominal values, okay? Um, because like if you, if, if you think of this more broadly, wages were also equally low at the same time, okay? And so maybe we could say in real terms, prices haven't changed or something like that. Um, okay, but again, nominal means something is not adjusted for inflation. Real means that it has been. And we'll talk later about how these adjustments are done. Okay, um, so there's a general... I principle that in economics it's a good idea to use real values for comparisons over time. Okay. Got it? Okay. Don't don't talk about what nominal prices were 20 years ago or what nominal wages were 20 years ago. Adjust that. And so, you know, you might hear an, a description of, you know, like um, $25,000 in 1990. And then maybe it's described as something like equivalent to $40,000 today. Okay. Um, you see the difference between a nominal value there and a real value. That wage of $25,000 or price of $25,000 in 1990, that's a nominal value, and it's been converted into a real value. Um, real values usually need to be expressed um, need to be expressed in some year. Okay, so equivalent to forty thousand dollars today, or maybe even better. Um, would be to say equivalent to um, $40,000 in 2021, okay? But, you know, the, the real value needs to express, be expressed in terms of some year, okay? Whether we're talking about things in 1990 dollars or in 2021 dollars or some other year. Okay, so let's see. Um, Use real values. Okay. Got it? Okay. Um, there might be an exception to this, which is when um, we're doing percentage changes. Okay. Unnecessary to specify the year when doing percentage changes. So, 
we can say something like um, the, the U.S. economy has grown in real terms 2% per year for the past decade. That doesn't need to be explained in terms of everything was converted into 2021 dollars or 2011 dollars. In that case, it's not necessarily to express what year everything was converted into because the percentage changes will be the same. Okay, so I've talked about these common adjustments to GDP. Um, choo -choo. Okay, now I'm going to come to something called the National Income Accounting Identity. Okay, here is a basic idea that I gave you all a few minutes ago. Everything that a country produces goes to one of four purposes. The end. Um, consumption, those are the things that we enjoy. Investment, that's stuff that makes the economy more productive in the future. Government use, or it gets exported. Okay. Everything does. Okay. Um, so um, this is called an identity because it must be true. It's also a useful way of thinking about what happens in, in the economy. Um, um, you know, so for example, if the output of a country remains the same, the product of a country remains the same, and government expenditure increases, then something else has to give. Yeah? I mean, so, so for example, I mean, a very real example is that the current presidential administration has proposed some large, or large spending packages that the government will spend money on um, education, oh, well, I think um, community college education was something that recently came out, invest in improving infrastructure, like highways, bridges, and so forth, um, and a variety of government expenditure, um, like, packages. Okay, um, so if what the country produces remains the same and government expenditures go up, it must come from somewhere. Um, so either the country is exporting less or um, people are forced to consume less or, we in, or the country invests less in the future. Okay. Make sense? Okay. I mean, so, so I'm also teaching you all something important about politics and or economic policy. Um, and, and I think this part is unavoidable. Now, the hope is, oh, by the way, so as much as I would like for the government to give out free ice cream to everyone, to have like free ice cream as part of government expenditures, it does come out of something. Now, you know, the hope is that some of these things, some of this government expenditure will effectively be investment that increases what the country produces in the future. Okay? And by the way, when it comes to improving infrastructure, highways, bridges, airports, um, that, that is absolutely a reasonable thing to believe. Or when it comes to investing more in education. And, and I am very, very um, supportive of community college educations, the idea that community college might be free for every high school graduate um, would be outstanding economically, just to ensure that everyone has access to training in some trade. Okay, so I think of those things as potentially um, uh, going, as potentially essentially investment, but okay, you get the general idea. Um, when, when it comes to something like government stimulus checks, they, that's just pure, actually, it's tricky. 
So that's, that's not a final good or service. Um, let me not say anything about government, uh, about stimulus checks, because I'm talking about what a country produces. Okay, so, by the way, cash is not something that a country produces. So when it's a government check to someone, that is not part of GDP. Okay, so anyhow, um, if you just think even physically, what gets produced in a country, like the physical goods that get produced in a country, go to one of these four purposes. Um, you know, again, it's a, like a car that gets produced. Either it's going to get purchased by some person who gets to drive around in it, or it's purchased by a company that uses the car to do whatever comp the company does, or the government purchases the car to do government stuff, or the car gets shipped overseas. But there's no fifth option here. Okay, um, everything goes towards one of these four purposes. And this leads to something that I as the national income accounting identity. Okay, identity means an equation that must be true. Um, okay, and this identity is usually written as y equals c plus i plus g plus x. Okay, what a country produces, why? Um, uh, I think that's the one abbreviation here that doesn't have any logical meaning to it. But, um, okay, what a country produces, that's why. C is for consumption, I for investment, G for government expenditure, X for net exports. Okay, um, so again, this X net exports, that's the difference between exports and imports. Okay, and as I said just a minute ago, it's a useful way, um, among other things, it's just a useful way of keeping in mind that this equation must always balance. So if consumption of a country grows and nothing else, or an income uh, doesn't change, or what the country produces doesn't change, it means that one of the other things has got to go down. Yeah, um, so if, if people in a country consume more, it means that they have less money to invest in the future, or um, the government has fewer, I guess, resources that, that it can purchase, um, or that the country is importing more than it exports. Okay, so, got it? Um, now, I want to go next into some you know, um, some limitations of using GDP, okay. So, real GDP per capita um, uh, per capita per capita is sort of a measure of um, how wealthy each person in a country is, um, how wealthy each person is on average. Okay. But it's not perfect. 
Oh, by the way, uh, let me just jump off onto a tangent. I, I apologize. I, I shouldn't like, have lectures so disorganized. But um, just to, to give you all some numbers, um, um, actual numbers. Um, the U.S. GDP is approximately, I think, $21 trillion. Okay? Just to give you all a number to sort of pin your, your um, mind around. So when you hear something like um, there's a government uh, expenditure package that will cost you know, $2 trillion, that means about a tenth of what the U.S. economy produces will go toward government expenditures. Okay. Um, ju just to give you some context, but this is a real number, $21 trillion. Um, per capita, that amounts to, I think it's about $65,000. Again, per person. Averages out to $65,000 per person. Now, that is nowhere near the average income of, uh, of an American person. Um, because, in part, wealth is concentrated. In part, because GDP doesn't all go to Americans. What, what the country produces doesn't all go to American workers. Okay. Um, anyhow, uh, and what else can I say? Oh, um, uh, the economy is about 80% services, 20% manufacturing, and about 1% agriculture. Okay, so got it? By far, the U.S. is an economy that produces services, um, though it has a substantial manufacturing sector. Okay, um, you know, agriculture is a pretty minor thing, but I suppose it is the third largest um, uh, part of the economy. Okay, anyhow, so all of that was kind of an aside. And now getting to this topic, real GDP per capita is kind of a measure of how wealthy a person of a country is on average. But it's not a perfect measure, and I've brought up maybe three ways that it would be appropriate to adjust GDP. Well, sorry. Um, G uh, it, it all, sorry, real GDP per capita already, actually, no, sorry. I back up even further. PPP, I should add in. Okay. Okay. Sorry. It's approximately how wealthy a person is. Okay, and we've talked about those three adjustments. Real, adjust for inflation. Per capita, adjust for population size. PPP, um, adjust for the cost of living. But it's still not perfect. And so some things not included are goods and services, that are not traded in the economy or not traded in markets. Okay, so for example, um, home production. Okay, if a farmer grows food for the farmer's own family, that is not counted in GDP. Okay, never went through a market, so it doesn't get counted in GDP. This type of home production 
um, and home industry is an issue for looking at, for comparing the economies of the least developed countries where there might be a substantial amount of home production, like subsistence farming. So you might hear a statistic like um, GDP per capita for some country is $3 per day. That does not mean that people are necessarily living off $3 per day worth of stuff. It could be that that is how much they produce that gets sold in the market, and it omits what they produce for themselves at home. Okay, so home production, at the same time, maybe in the U.S., it includes things like um, uh, health care and child care. Okay, which are substantial activities like healthcare, people, especially people taking care of um, aging relatives, right? It is a job, it is a service. If I hire someone to take care of my mother, then that service gets counted in GDP. If I do it myself, I'm still producing the same service. But since I'm not purchasing it in the market, um, it doesn't get counted as part of GDP. So things like, again, like health care, child care um, uh, are, are typically not counted in GDP. Okay. Um, a second is goods and services traded in the informal economy. Um, informal economy. Okay. Informal economy is something like a black market or a gray market. Okay, and so, so you all get the idea of a black market or maybe a gray market is something that, that is less, uh, I don't, it sounds le less horrible. Um, the, the term economists would probably prefer is informal economy. So, of course, this does include the value of, oh, I don't know, outright illegal things that might get produced in a country. Um, uh, but it could also, like gray market, think of um, like cash under the table types of jobs. Okay, that's the informal economy. Have any of you all had that type of job? Babysitting, mowing lawns, that type of thing where you just got handed a wad of cash and you and your employer didn't really care about paying payroll taxes or even whether you were paid the minimum wage or, you know, they probably didn't pay your workers' compensation bill, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's all informal economy. Um, so, you know, the terms black market or gray market sound more judgmental. Um, now, informal economies are a big deal in some countries. Um, and again, this is something that's more relevant when comparing the US to other countries, such as Mexico, where about half of labor is employed in the informal economy, and half of labor is employed in the formal economy. Formal economy, that's where people pay taxes and um, labor laws apply. Informal economy is informal. Okay, um, again, it's that idea of cash under the table. Um, okay, now, um, you know, how do we include things like um, uh, the sex industry? Or um, illicit drugs? 
right? A country could be producing those things and producing a lot in those industries, but again, as part of the informal economy, they very, very well might not be counted. Okay, so got these sort of objections. Um, a final thing is average is not the same thing as typical. So, like, the, the things, the, the adjustments we make for things like um, per capita, it's the average income, but it's not a, a great measure of typical. And, right, you all know that, that there are times when the average is not very normal, yeah? Um, have you had a stats course? Okay, you've had a stats course. You've been told that there are three measures of central tendency or something like that. They are the mm, mm, and mm. I'll start with M. Okay, mean, median, mode. Great, okay. And um, yeah, you hear statistics like the average... This is the one that I would always use when I taught stats. The average cost of a wedding um, is like, oh, I don't know. Someone give me a number if you've paid attention recently. Anyone consulted a website? Okay, something like thirty to $40,000. Okay. Now... This is far from what the typical American family spends on a wedding, which is more in the range of four to five thousand dollars. Okay, the the typical or median family might spend four or five thousand dollars, but the average can still be thirty thousand dollars because of what? How does this happen? How's there such a big difference between the median and the average? You have a few large, oh, go ahead. Yeah, outliers, a few large values will pull up the average. Okay, so, you know, you could have, oh, I don't know, about 10 families spending nothing on a wedding and one family spend nine families spend nothing on a wedding. One family spends three hundred thousand and averages out to thirty thousand, even though that's very different from the experience of most people. Okay, so average might not be typical, especially when there is um, inequality. Okay, I guess that's something to be aware of is like, it's sort of like those outliers, those, extru those people who spend a whole lot on their wedding or the people who are fantastically wealthy um, can, can get a very large share and can contribute a lot to the average. Um, okay, the, fur the more inequality there is, in a country, typically the, the more uh, the, the more the average will differ from the median. Okay? The median is like the middle of the road. Like the most like if you line up American families from the wealthiest to the poorest, the median family is the one right in the center of the income distribution. Okay. So I've brought up average is not necessarily what's typical and especially not when there's inequality. Okay, so talk through GDP and some of the topics surrounding it. Next thing on my list is to talk about unemployment. Um, Okay, so, again, 
this is an important macroeconomic variable. If you listen to the news on the macroeconomy, you will hear about the unemployment rate, especially over the past year. Everyone's been obsessed with what's happening to the unemployment rate. Okay, so um, what exactly is it? That's what we're going to do now. Um, so there are maybe two things to be aware of with unemployment. One is it can mean one of two different things. Okay, it can mean receiving benefits or it could mean the kind of generally um, it's a statistical classification okay Talking about unemployment in terms of the number of people receiving benefits or jobless claims is less common. Um, uh, it's, it's less common. It's the, the less common way you will hear people talk about unemployment. The... So, just to make you all aware, um, there are a variety of programs in the U.S. known as unemployment insurance. Okay. And this is what people typically think of as unemployment benefits or jobless claims. Basically, the way that unemployment benefits work is they are a that the programs were set up as essentially insurance. You know how like your car insurance or your homeowner's insurance or your health insurance pays you money when something bad happens to you and it's not your fault. Okay, um, unemployment insurance was intended to be something similar or is something similar. Um, it's an insurance policy that pays off if you lose your job through no fault of your own. Okay, and then um, these unemployment insurance programs, again, that's what people describe as receiving unemployment benefits. Um, they are a fraction of earnings. Um, fraction of typical earnings for the worker um, and they have a limited duration. Okay, so for example, in North Carolina, a worker who loses a job through no fault of the worker's own receives a typically receives approximately 50% of their typical salary for up to 15 weeks. Okay, got it? Okay, and this is funded by a tax that your employer pays when hiring you. Okay, so, you know, officially it's an insurance program or an insurance policy. It pays off when you lose your job through no fault of your own. Now, in the past year, all kinds of funny things have been done with these unemployment benefits. Um, and the, there have been bonuses to them. There have been so, for example, last summer, I think it was a $600 a week bonus um, uh, unemployment benefit. The durations have been extended, um, have been extended repeatedly. Also, there are some other requirements for receiving unemployment benefits, including that you have to be actively searching for a job. 
and produced evidence that you're searching for a job. Over the past year, th that requirement has been waived. So you no longer have to search for a job. Um, you no longer have to accept a job if offered to you. And this is in part to allow people who feel uncomfortable returning to a safe workplace to refrain from having to, to enter a safe workplace. So it's kind of a safety net for, for people who, who don't work, want to work under COVID conditions. Okay, now, that's, um, those are unemployment benefits. And again, that's typically not what is referred to as unemployment, and it's definitely not what the unemployment rate is based on. So unemployment rates attempt to be a measure of the health of the, the labor market. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics generates some of our best government numbers. Um, the BLS. Okay. Every month goes around and conducts a survey of, let's see, I think it's 60,000 households. And within those households, interviews everyone who is ages 16 and up, civilian, and uninstitutionalized. Okay. Um, all of these people are surveyed. So this amounts to surveying about 150-ish thousand people a month um, and asks them a set of questions about their work behavior. Now, just to clarify, again, th this group, 16 and up, civilian, uninstitutionalized. So that means that they are not living, uninstitutionalized means they are, for the most part, not in the prison, not in the military, even though that's redundant, um, not living in an assisted living facility, or something along those lines. Um, uh, okay, this group is called the population. Okay. Um, for the sake of, of these calculations, that's the whole population of people being surveyed for the unemployment rate um, or the labor force participation rate. It includes everyone who meets those criteria. And then among the, the questions that the BLS asks include, or I mean, basically the classification of being unemployed is based on two questions. The first of these is during the past um, weeks, I believe it's two weeks, did you work for pay? Okay. If people answer Okay, people can answer no or yes. If a person answers yes, then the person is classified as being employed. End of story. Okay. Um, if the person says no during the past two weeks, I did not work for, for pay, 
then there's a follow-up question. Um, during the past weeks, did you search for a job? Okay, and to this person can again answer no or yes. Okay, if the person answers yes, then the person is classified as unemployed. If the person answers no, then the person is classified as out of the labor force. Okay. And instead of writing out out of the labor force all the time, we often abbreviate OLF, out of the labor force. Okay, so if you all don't mind, I'm going to survey you all. Um, during the past uh, two weeks, who worked for pay? Okay, you all are employed as far as the BLS is concerned. Okay, of those of you who did not work for pay, who searched for a job in the past two weeks? Okay, so you all are unemployed. Okay, um, and of those of you who did not work for pay, how many of you did not search for a job? Okay, so out of the labor force. Got it? Um, out of the labor force is a designation for kind of, I'll write approximately, people not working by choice. So, you know, think of students and um, homemakers and um, uh, uh, retirees. Okay, people not working. I'm going to add something in the market by choice. Okay. I think many homemakers would, would say correctly that they do plenty of work. It's just not in the formal labor market. Okay, so OLF is a classification for people who sort of don't want to work um, and, and are choosing not to work. People who are unemployed are people who would like to have jobs, but they don't have them. And employed are people who do have jobs. Okay. The labor force is defined as the number who are employed plus unemployed. Okay. It's also equal to the population minus the number who are OLF. By the way, I should clarify this. Um, according to the BLS classification system, everyone in the population falls into one of these categories. Um, either employed or unemployed, or out of the labor force, okay? Everyone. Those are all the categories. If you add up the number of people employed plus the number unemployed plus out of the labor force, it adds up to the population. Every one of the population belongs to exactly one of those groups. Yes? Wait, there's no separate section for like self-employment, is there? Like you're self-employed, is there a separate, you classify differently? Okay. Is there a separate classification for self-employment? Um, the, the answer is for this, no, okay? Really, like the, the first question, 
during the past weeks, did you work for pay? And that includes self-employed work. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so, yeah. Um, so self-employed people are typically among the employed. Now, the BLS, to its, to its credit, th these are, it, BLS asks more questions and does get at self-employment. Um, but for unemployment statistics, these two questions are essentially all that matter. And your responses to these two questions determine where you're cla classified. Like, when I asked those two questions of the class, I did a perfect job of deciding or identifying where you would be classified by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That is almost exactly how it's done, which I bring this up so you'll understand what unemployed means and it doesn't mean. Okay? In particular, unemployed doesn't mean without a job because people who are out of the labor force also um, don't have jobs. The majority of people who don't have jobs don't have jobs by choice and are therefore out of the labor force. Um, uh, okay, so let me write down this summary. Oh, oh, uh, no, no, I won't do that. Okay, so the labor force. Okay, final thing. The unemployment rate is the fraction or the percentage of the labor force that is unemployed. So unemployed divided by the labor force. It is not the percent of the population that is unemployed. It's the percent of the labor force. Okay. Um, another thing, another important statistic sometimes is the labor force participation rate. Participation rate, okay, um, LFPR, um, which is the size of the labor force relative to the population, okay? The percent of the population who are in the labor force, okay? Often this is, yeah. Yes. And sorry to interrupt you, but um, I saw on the move there was a button sign that was second. Ah, okay. Um, yes, okay, just second. Um, uh, yeah. Um, labor force participation rate, it's the fraction of the population in the labor force. Often this is described for subgroups of the population. So like the labor force participation rate for women versus men, um, for black workers versus white workers, labor force participation rate for people over 60. Okay, so anyhow, you've got these two statistics. And um, 